Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Great to be here with you. Episode 23, 72 of the Cabral Concept. Today, I'm going to be sharing with you uh, a whole lot of fun-based science on why we have body odor and how to get rid of it. So I've gotten actually a lot of Cabral host call questions. Those are the weekend shows where we answer our community's questions. Lots of questions about, hey, how come I started to get body odor when this happened? Hey, why did it go away when I did something like this? So I want to share with you exactly why the latest science on why this happens and what it's connected to. And then, of course, what you can do about it in order to get rid of your own body odor. So uh, uh, fun show here today, again, always by popular requests. So keep those requests coming. This podcast is really all about our community and what questions they have. And it's my job to do my best to answer those based on my experience in the field. And then, of course, any research that I'm happy to do. So let's dive right into today's show. And again, all those show notes are at stephencabral.com forward slash 2378. And I will also link up all of the research links there as well in case you're wanting to go a little bit deeper of a dive. All right, so basically body odor can come in a few different ways. So we can think of it as just our sweat. We actually, humans have three types of sweat glands. Uh, I'll be talking about that more in just a moment. But also some people um, talk about bad breath or they talk about kind of smelly urine or smelly stool, those types of things. And uh, we'll be mostly focused on why the change in body odor and what causes this smell in the first place. So Essentially, and this is super interesting because when you look at the specific science, you're like, well, um, you know, I just sweat a lot, so that's why I have body odor. But it's actually not the case. So the, we'll call it fluid for lack of a better term, the fluid that leaves your body through sweat actually doesn't have an odor. Like they've, they've tested this now. What happens is it reacts with the bacteria and microbes on the skin, which then causes the smell. So I'm going to give you a few examples. Of course, it's in uh, medical-based speak, so I'm just going to translate to human speak. But um, basically, key volatile fatty acids that contribute to body odor include 3-methyl-2-hexanoic acid, which has goat-like odor, and 3-hydroxy-3-methyl-hexanoic acid has a cumin like odor, which is like an herb. Then there's a few more. So 3-methyl-3 sulfon hexan one ol is a thiol alcohol produced by a specific bacteria, the stepha, um, Staphylococcus hominis bacteria, which makes the underarms smell like onions or meat. So I'm going to give you just a couple more, and then we'll kind of say, hey, what, what's this all about? Uh, there's a, a few more. So yellow fever is said to uh, cause people to smell like a butcher shop, basically meat, right? Typhoid fever can make people smell like bread. Again, all of this very strange, but quite interesting, in my opinion, at the same time. Then we have uh, strep throat. We might have post-nasal drip. We might have sinus infections. We might have colds. Uh, we might have upper respiratory illnesses that actually cause uh, a little bit more halitosis or bad breath as the mucus begins to accumulate as well as bacteria in the back of the throat. And guess what? Well, that mucus also interacts with the bacteria and it gives off a certain smell. There's much more to the halitosis and bad breath though that I will go uh, more into in just a moment uh, as well. But Here's the interesting thing, because I've done this on, on many Friday Review podcasts, is that I've talked about this, that uh, be, humans don't have that great of smell. And men have an even worse smell than women. So women do a much better job at picking up odors. And uh, one thing I'll share with you is this, is that we know that dogs can actually be trained to smell uh, things like cancer, to smell things even maybe like COVID and viruses on people's bodies. So they believe, again, science believes that there's a change in body odor for two, base, two basic reasons. One, if it's not a uh, really malevolent infection or virus or something happening to the body, it could 
because they see this in animals, it could cause uh, others within your tribe or community or family to show more compassion or kindness towards you. That, that smell might be faint enough for us just to pick that up, and we want to then care for the individual. However, some viruses or infections are so uh, malevolent that it would actually be repulsive to another human, and then they, that other humans would want to stay away so that they don't catch whatever that, um, again, virus is that, that others don't necessarily want to have because it would be detrimental to them as well. So as you might have started to pick up, there are reasons, and I've only gone through a couple, such as infections, bacterial uh, or viral infections, that can actually change the body odor. And it changes the body odor as the immune system begins to ramp up in these particular cases. And potentially, or potentially, we have a greater amount of certain types of bacteria that seem, at least in terms of infection, seem to be transient. However, I have gotten a few house calls where people actually ask, since I've had the virus, uh, my body odor has actually changed. To me, that's a sign that the microbiome, the gut, may have actually changed or your body is still at an elevated level of inflammation because the immune system is not fully regulated yet. And we can talk about uh, a couple tips on how to fix those things in just a moment. So I've got a really nice graphic that I want you to check out. It's at stephencabral.com forward slash 2372. And I always like to give credit where credit's due. This was created by compoundchem.com. I have no idea who they are. It's a great graphic, though. So I'm going to share that with you, of course, and then with some of the science as well. One of the best articles I've seen on it uh, up to date. Because the truth is that although science knows a lot of these chemical compounds, uh, specific fatty acids and bacteria, they don't exactly know why this is caused. There's hypotheses. There's theories. There's educated guesses. Uh, and, and Ayurveda actually says about the same. Like it, it's meant to actually be at a uh, pheromones, not the right word, but a a level where other humans it's perceptible to, through through the olfactory nerve or other senses as well. You know, potentially even energy based. All right, so let's look at this halitosis. All right, what could be causing it? Well, uh, I'm not going to actually, because you know what? It'll be super boring for you to go through all of the different um, science-based terms. It's it's boring for me to go through it, so <laughs> I have no doubt, and I love this. Uh, so no, no doubt it's probably not that interesting for you. But alcohol-based, uh, uh, again, don't think of drinking alcohol, but actually alcohol-based components within your body or sulfur-based components. And that may smell like garlic. It might smell like rotten eggs. It might smell like cabbage. It might smell like sulfur or it might sound smell kind of sweet. Okay. So that's an imbalance right there causing bad breath, halitosis. Underarm odor could smell like onion or cumin or goat. One more that isn't added here that sometimes when people get too deep into ketosis, it can actually smell almost metallic. And that goes for halitosis as well as underarm. Now there's different causes for that, not just um, being too low, let's say on carbs, right? All right. Um, in terms of intestinal based gas, right? Another odor that can be from sulfur, again, alcohol. So think of fermentation. When I say alcohol, think of like yeast, bacterial fermentation, right? It can smell like rotten eggs. It can smell like garlic. It can smell like sulfur. It can smell like cabbage. Uh, it could smell sweet as well. I don't know about why they keep putting sweet in there, but uh, that's from dimethyl sulfate. Sulfide could actually be some more the sweet smell. And then there is what? There's foot odor, right? So foot odor can be, well, it can it can be from a few interesting ones. So there's uh, two new ones. So the one that comes back to like that fermentation or alcohol, that's uh, methyl ethyl. And that is the sulfur and garlic based smell from someone's foot's foot. However, uh, a pungent or rancid or sour smell would be coming from uh, propanoic acid, and then a cheesy fermented or rancid smell would be from isovaleric acid. So uh, pretty interesting that they have actually isolated these specific compounds to correlate with the different types of smells. All right, so now let's go just a little bit deeper past the infections. All right, past the viruses. So super important, again, that we know all of these do exist. But then there's also overall toxicity. So we found, and again, you can take a free assessment. It's completely free. You don't even have to enter your email address. And that's at stephencabral.com forward slash assessments. And it's the um, toxicity assessment or the rain barrel effect assessment. And that's free in the book as well. And essentially, the higher your score on that lab, potentially the more body odor that you have because you're dealing with what? Well, your body is literally 
filling up with toxicity. Now, it could be toxicity from the gut, could be from hormones, could be from food sensitivities, could be from yeast, could be from bacteria. Uh, and, and there's a lot of different factors. However, we do know and we see the correlation that the higher that rain barrel effect score, the higher the toxicity score, which we call the total body burden in natural based health, uh, the more body odor you may have. So I'm going to get to that in just a moment uh, because there's one more piece to this. But another one is this. When people go on certain medications, this goes if they're on a virus, right? They have a virus or they you know, have an infection, they get put on certain compounds, whether it be antibiotics, antivirals, et cetera, um, or just medications in general, cholesterol medication, blood pressure medication, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it can actually change the pH of the tissues, not the blood, okay? So the blood maintains right around 7.3, you know, right around there. Uh, it can be a point of, uh, point 0.1 above, point 0.2 or point 0.1 below, but it's right around there. It stays uh, homeostatic for the most part. However, the tissues don't stay the same. They're, they're not. The tissues of the body could vary widely between like a let's say a two, three for the stomach uh, when you're producing stomach acid uh, during a meal uh, to higher than an eight, okay? So when we look at that, there's, there's a wide range. But then also we have the pH of the skin. And this is important because the pH of the skin, if that changes, right? And it's, let's say, not as acidic, so it can't kill as much bacteria. If the skin actually gets a little bit more alkaline, more bacteria could actually fester and grow. So very interesting. It's one of the reasons why uh, raw apple cider vinegar uh, can work as a great toner, specifically specifically uh, for the skin as well. But again, we're not going to go too deep on that today. All right, the next one is gut issues. So it's my opinion, again, like most of this centers around the gut because 80% of your immune system is around the 26 feet of intestinal tract. Uh, and the large uh, factor with halitosis for sure is gut-based issues. Because basically, you have food fermenting in your stomach or your intestines, uh, and that can lead to halitosis. We see it all the time because we also see it clear up all the time as well. All right, so the last one is poor detox. That kind of goes back to toxicity. But some people are just more prone to poor detox, meaning like, Okay, so from a genetic factor, like I say, genetics matter, but they never necessarily um, allow for disease. It's the environment that allows for the disease. So everyone has their certain genetics. I'll give myself as an example because I don't like to talk too much about all the clients that we work with, although I can always give anecdotal. Uh, I just can't obviously give their names, things like that, but I can talk about myself. So here's the thing. At 17, uh, I ended up getting autoimmune issues. I got Addison's disease. I had uh, insomnia. I had mastocytosis, like terrible allergies. I had POT syndrome. I had type 2 diabetes. So I had a lot going on with my body and a whole lot went wrong. Why did it all go wrong? Well, you could say it's my genetics. Sure. Okay. So let's go with that. So I had poor genetics still have poor genetics. It's my genetics, right? So when you look at your genome, if you decode it, um, and we'll be sharing a lot more of that in September, so definitely stay tuned, that uh, there, there are certain factors, there's no doubt about it, that affect inflammation, that affect your body's ability to break down sulfur, uh, to be able to absorb B vitamins for stress, detox, etc. Okay, so I have all, I have all of that, and, uh, and I was sick for 10 years. Okay, so why? It's been 20 plus years later. Why don't I have any of those things today. No mastocytosis, no autoimmune, no type 2 diabetes, no Addison's disease, no insomnia, et cetera, et cetera. How is that possible? I'm so much older, right? I'm, I'm aging every single year, but I have the same genetics. Well, it's the environmental expression of that, right? So what did I have to do? I had to fix my gut. I had to fix overall stress. I had to go through what's called the de-stress protocol, right? So I had to empty my rain barrel literally and figuratively. Uh, that's what I had to do. That's why I also didn't get well overnight because I didn't know all of this. That's why I've also put it in a book. I try to give the book away for free. It's literally just shipping for the book or you can buy it on Amazon, wherever you'd like. But I try to give this information away for free, right? So if you do something like the CBO protocol and you have digestive and gut issues, Again, I can't provide you any medical advice, medical treatment plans, medical cures, medical diagnosis, but it, it helps with halitosis. How does it help with that? Well, again, we're not giving you a mint or breath spray, right? That's masking the symptoms. That's what conventional medicine teaches you to do. And it's not like you shouldn't brush your teeth. Of course, you should brush your teeth, right? But what happens is we want to do things to help the sinuses. We want to do things to help the gut. So we do the CBO protocol, but you may also want to do like a neti pot rinse that I've talked about before. A couple drops maybe of citricidal or a couple drops of citrus drops or or something like that to clean out those nasal passages over a week, two weeks, three weeks, and then stop, right? So 
we, that's, those are the things that we teach. But what I wanted to share with you today is like everything has an underlying reason. So if people tell you that there's no cure for body odor, there's no cure for this, there's no cure for that. Well, I'm telling you right now, we've had people do 21 day functional medicine detoxes and say they've gotten rid of body odor, right? So I'm just sharing that with you. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't wear deodorant and it doesn't mean that you won't smell sometimes. You will. You build up bacteria, it's going to smell. But we're talking about that toxic smell of bacteria, right? We're not talking about regular body odor where, you know, you uh, showered in the morning, you've worked all day, you're sweating like I am in my office right now because there's no air conditioning in my in my main office. It's, it's a beautiful place, but it's, it's very rural. And um, so, so you sweat, right? So let's say that by the time you go to bed, you've done a workout as well. You walked your 10,000 steps. You might smell just a little bit. Like that's normal. Like there's really nothing wrong with that. But when you smell pungent or you smell rancid through any of your sweat glands, right? Or your feet, still sweat glands, I know, uh, or your breath or anything like that, there is an imbalance. There is a bacterial buildup or an infection, or there is an imbalance with the immune system, or there's gut issues, or all of them, right? And so what you have to do is you have to begin to figure out what they are. Now, you can run the big five. That's an easy way to do it. If you think it's gut issues, you could run the gut bundle. That'll help tremendously. And um, you can also, though, just start to live a healthier lifestyle as well. Like You can begin by simply taking the rain barrel or taking the toxicity assessment. That's free. And you can see your score. Then if you've never done a 21-day functional medicine detox, do a 21-day functional medicine detox. You can find the details of that at stephencabral.com forward slash detox. And then if needed, you can begin a specific gut-based protocol like the CBO protocol. Or the thing is, like again, it's, it's information. So if you want to work with your local, local naturopathic doctor, please do that. If you want to work with your integrative health practitioner virtually, please do that. Whatever you feel is best for you. What I wanted to teach you here today, though, is there's always a reason why. We know a lot of the reason why, but we also know then how to mitigate that as well. So I'm happy to do follow-ups on this. I really am, but I like to give one topic per podcast and then obviously build off of that. And then I can always link back to this show in the future. So hopefully this was helpful. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning into the show. Have an amazing day, and I'll be chatting with you tomorrow on our Friday review. Take care.